how would you handle flying single pilot at night in the winter into the mountains and getting five reroutes all by yourself? Hey guys, my name is Katie and I fly single pilot as a corporate pilot and I'm here to take you along on my day in the life and show you exactly what the life actually looks like and all of the flying duties included. A lot of people don't necessarily want to be an airline pilot, but they love flying and they want to see what other career options are out there for pilots. So I've worked primarily in the part 135 world, which if you're not aware is sort of the charter or private aviation side of the house, as opposed to 121 world, which is the airline side of the house. And I have a lot of experience in those types of jobs. And now I work at a part 91 company, which basically just means a company that flies only for their own private needs. So I'm going to take you guys along from start to finish through my day to day. This was a standard day in the life. This was actually one of the longer days that I've had so far at this job, but this will just kind of give you a good idea of what the day looks like, what the additional duties are, and I will spare no detail on all of the additional tasks that you may have to do if you chose this career route. So follow along with me for the day in the life of a corporate pilot. If you have any questions or comments, put them in the comment section of this video. I read every single one personally, and this channel is about helping the aviation community. So you can really help other people by sharing the information in the comment section so that everybody could read it and benefit from that knowledge. So come along and let's fly today from Idaho to California and back. This particular day started about 7.30 a.m. when I woke up and got ready at home. I wear all black for this flight in particular, just that's kind of our uniform. We don't really have a uniform, but we do have like golf shirts that we wear with our logo. And then the winter, I have to wear a lot of layers because it is quite cold in Idaho. But we're wearing layers because I'm going to fly to California where it's like 65 degrees. So you got to be prepared for all of it on these kind of trips. So I went out, let the chickens out, and then I went to a grocery store after this because I did not have time to pack a lunch. So I just went to the store and were able to expense the food items that we eat on these days. So I just bought a sandwich and a couple other things so that I can have food on this long day that I'm about to go on. We get to the plane about an hour before and it's all just on our own. All of the pre-flight planning I do through ForeFlight. I also will do my weight and balance and my takeoff and landing distance through the Pilatus app. And that is just on me to do it on my own. Obviously, that's a legal requirement. So we do comply with all of that, but it is not done by dispatch or anybody else. But about an hour before I get to the plane, do the pre-flight, stock the coffee and ice and whatever snacks we need, maybe do some vacuuming or whatever else is required at that point in time double check notams, double check weather and so forth, and then get ready to go. The night before or a few days before, I will call all of the FBOs and let them know I'm coming and also make sure that the trip sheet looks correct for times so and so forth. So it should be about two hours and 20 minutes to California. I've already gotten to the airport, done the pre-flight. I'm just on an empty leg out of here. So I've stocked the snacks, the drinks and the ice done the pre-flight inspection, and now I'm just on my own to California. So I took off about 10 o'clock and I was climbing out here till 23,000 feet, which was my filed altitude. And I was cleared up to that altitude. It was a beautiful weather, this whole flight. There was a big high pressure system over the whole Pacific Northwest. So high pressure is usually clear skies and good weather. And it just definitely made the day a little bit easier. I flew over seven hours this day by myself and it's really interesting how much of a difference the weather will make with your fatigue levels. So again, empty leg, just me getting the plane down there to pick people up and and then I will take the passengers where they're looking to go. So right about now I was passing through a flight level 180 where I push this barrow button and then it switches the altimeter over to standard. And then I also will do that on my backup attitude indicator. So everything is set to two niner, niner two in the flight levels. I topped off the airplane of fuel at my home base because it is always cheaper to buy fuel at our home base. So I tried to tanker where I can. And since it was just me empty, I really had a lot of weight available for fuel. So I still did get fuel down in California, but I did save some money for the client in that respect. And we try to do that. We're trying to always be aware of costs. And even though it is obviously very expensive to run and operate a private plane, you know, every penny counts and the pilots can do some money saving by going to FBOs that have lower uh, fees and better rewards programs and cheaper fuel rates. So I just do stay aware of those kinds of things. 
So obviously I am not showing all of the running of checklists and those kinds of other items, but I'm doing all of the pilot duties, you know, um, all the pre-flight planning, all of the checklist items per the AFM for the Pilatus. And then at this point I was getting reroute number one of five from ATC, which I always find kind of funny on the way down to Southern California. You always get a ton of reroutes and they're never really that different. It's not like there's a new MOA that pops up and they have to send you way around it. It's just slightly different kind of along the same area that they want you to go to. So I didn't mind because it gave me something to do on this flight, but I did get five, <laughs> which might be the most I've gotten on the way down there. So I use a knee board and everybody makes fun of me for it because it's kind of like something you don't do once you become a professional pilot, but I do fly single pilot. And so I've had a lot of times where I have a checklist on the yoke mount in front of me. I have an iPad mount next to me and I do still need to write something down. I know a lot of pilots will write in the scratch pad of the iPad and it just takes too long. It's annoying to me. So I use a knee board you know, sue me, <laughs> but I love it. I will continue to use it. And I found that single pilot, it actually is very helpful because sometimes you just do not have time or an extra set of hands to go digging around for a pad of paper or something like that. I also keep a couple things in my flight bag out throughout the window. Um, I keep a hat, obviously I keep hat and gloves. I do keep a headlamp as well. That's another thing that I do at night. I, I fly with a headlamp again, single pilot. There's been times where it's like, you know, you have an in-flight emergency and you just need things to be right around your person. So um, obviously water, I always put a little pinch of Celtic sea salt in my water that helps kind of stay hydrated. Even if you're like a traveler on an airliner, um, you're going to get dehydrated up there in the dry air. So a little bit of Celtic sea salt and do um, as much water as you can. Obviously you got to kind of prepare yourself to not be using the bathroom on these flights a single pilot external charger is also a must i break that this plane does not have that hookup usb that you can like charge your phone in the plane so i always bring external charger on these long days and then i always bring snacks so i've been trying to do a lot of fruits and vegetables i bring my whole lunch like i said i went to the grocery store before this particular flight and bought a sandwich but i try to pack from home that's really big on keeping inflammation down um I have a fitness guide that I've written for pilots about how to keep inflammation down. This has a lot of workouts you can do on the road, but I also have kind of become like an expert in keeping inflammation down. Cause if you don't know when you're sitting all day like this, you're going to get a lot of inflammation, which is the root cause of like all diseases as we know. So if you want that PDF guide, it's in my stand store, which is like linked in all of the profiles of my Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. And it's under fitness guide. You'll be able to figure out which one it is. So hopefully that helps. I have been on an endeavor to get iPad mounts for all of our Pilatuses. And this is like option number four that I've tried. None of them have worked. It's been a crazy, annoying, annoying process. But I think this one might be the winner. It's a window mount. And I was just putting it together here and testing it out because um, I wanted to try it out in you know, sunny skies, no in VMC and all those kinds of things to see if it like falls off or causes any problems. So I was putting that together and then I tested that out for the rest of the flight and it actually worked really well. So I did a little moving of this. I actually put it first on this window and then moved it to a smaller window, which was kind of more um, out of the way. And I really like it there. So we'll see if you fly a PC-12 and you have a yoke mount set up that you like, please, please, please put it in the comments because I am really looking for a good setup and it has been a very frustrating process to find that. But this looks pretty good and I think it's going to work for now. It's like out of the way of everything, but there's also, you know, approach plates that'll be kind of right in front of your face, which is what I like. So we'll see. I will keep you updated on this process. So in this clip, I'm showing you just some of the things that I use on the Honeywell Apex Primus system. So I like to go to the airport and go see the weather before I even get the ATIS because you can kind of get an idea of what runway is going to be in use, what approach they're going to be using. But you'll notice there on the screen, the next rag of the satellite and the TFRs are all yellowed out, which means they're not getting data. So I was not able to get the weather until I got the ATIS, which is like pretty close to the field. That's why I really like this feature that they allow you to get the weather on the screen here. As soon as you pass over the mountains just to the west of Las Vegas area, there's normally like a fog bank that sits there. And I'll, I have a video that I'll show you of that. And it's really clear to see from the sky. So even though it was completely clear skies where I was, I knew I was going to be going down into IMC and needing to do an approach. And so I wanted to get an idea of the weather for that. But 
they did not have it. Another thing you can do here is you can go to the web, the frequencies and you can send them to COM2 like I just did there. So instead of typing in the ATIS frequency, I will just send it over. I also verify it with the chart because I just want to double check those kinds of things. The weather, like I said, was incredibly beautiful. This is passing over the mountains here, starting to kind of see the different snow layers. You can really tell the difference. I mean, you can see the exact altitude where there's you know, snow forming on the peaks and not melting. But this mountain crossing is one of my favorites in the whole country. It's just so beautiful in the winter with the snow on the peaks and seeing all the little rivers and valleys. And I just think it's incredible. So this is that fog bank I was talking about. You can see it just goes right up to the edge of the mountains and sits there. And then everything on the coastal side, the California side is all fogged in. That's exactly what it was today. That's why it's always that way in like Seattle and everything as well, because the mountains will sit there and just kind of trap the fog up against the coast. And right around this point in the flight, I got reroute number five. So it was just kind of funny. They gave me so many and it's just because California is busy airspace I and mean, you have LAX there, all kinds of things. So I believe at this point they gave me a Victor Airway and then that just throws in a bunch of points, which it's kind of helpful, but there's all five of them. You can see, yeah, Victor 459 was my last rear out to the Seal Beach VOR. So kind of funny and totally normal on the way down to California. At this point, they began to just send me down and get ready to send me into the approach area. They kind of send you out over the water here, just west of California. And then I landed on runway 20 right to the ILS for that. Um, the airport was a madhouse because it was Thanksgiving and everybody was super busy. So I waited there for a bit and then they changed my altitude on the way home to 22,000 feet instead of 24. So I just took a screenshot of the winds and everything just so I would have that for fuel differences and in-flight planning and just kind of be able to compare that with what I was actually seeing. So this was about two o'clock in the afternoon. I was heading back to Northern Idaho from California. This was a three hour and 20 minute leg. It was it was a long one. It was a very, very long flight. About two hours is where I'm like, okay, I'm ready to get out of the plane. Um, but this was three and a half. So long leg, but again, beautiful weather. I had my lunch up there. I had um, beautiful scenery over the mountains. And then I was going to be like landing in the mountains at night. So I was going to land about six o'clock mountain time. So like I said, I always have a headlamp. I keep it on my neck in flight when it's night flying. Um, that way, if there's any issues, glitches, electrical failures, I have something I can read a checklist with or whatever the case may be. So I got that ready. I also put another layer on. I put on a sweater and then a big, I have a big area coat that I wear and it's waterproof and all those good things. So I put that on, was ready to go, and the sun was starting to go down into the mountains. So I was getting ready for the approach. I was planning the RNAV 3-4 into McCall, Idaho. Um, I knew there was going to be different weather, clouds, icing on the way in. And so this is pretty typical in the mountains in the winter in Idaho. Um, but when it shifts from day to night to this, from VMC to IMC, you always have to be kind of ready for... Um, going into a different level of focus and just be ready to double check your checklists and um, do everything as far ahead as you can. I always try to get the weather, get the approach put in as far out as I can. So I think it's really interesting that airlines are trying to go to this whole single pilot thing. Airbus is just talking about beginning to certify a um, A320 single pilot. As someone who flies single pilot and has for most of my career, I think this is insane. As you can see in this video, I do take some additional precautions with my kneeboard, with my headlamp, with putting the jacket on beforehand. I bring a GPS emergency locating beacon that I keep with me. I keep a carbon monoxide detector with me in the cockpit. All these kinds of things because it's kind of the idea that if you're flying single pilot, whatever you don't have on your person or in arm's reach, it just doesn't exist there in the cockpit. And there's additional things that you need to be aware of for safety's sake. So it's really interesting to see this idea of single pilot as someone who does it. This plane is a lot more simple than an Airbus, you know, which is why it is allowed to be flown single pilot. We also have pretty high insurance minimums for our particular aircraft. Um, so this is not a beginner pilot job at all by any means. So just my two cents on that. But this was my day. This is a typical day for me. This was the only day that I worked this week. But I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments. I read all of them personally. And I would love to know your thoughts, especially about the single pilot operation type stuff, because this is a really interesting conversation. And I would love to hear different perspectives.